Hi, and welcome to Foreign Comics Calling, the podcast for all things foreign comics related. I'm Ken, and on behalf of my co-hosts, Eric, Matt, and Stephen, we'd like to welcome you to another prodigious episode. <laughs> Ooh, prodigious. <laughs> prodigious. Prodigious. Oh, the prodigal, prodigal son's return. You got gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We, it's good to have the gang back together, I must admit. Yeah. Here. Yeah, it's been a little while. Yeah. yeah, we took a few months off our months, weeks, maybe uh, just life gets in the way. Sometimes we all have stuff going on and the quarantine is not helping the situation. So uh, we did the crossover episode with uh, with um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, John Z. Uh, John, uh, that was a lot of fun. We talked about our quarantine uh habit adjustments we didn't i guess we didn't really talk about it on our feed how's how's quarantine life treating you guys how, how are you making out well uh i'm okay i'm surprisingly holding up well personally i think um slightly paranoid oh, there's a tinge of that getting in mm-hmm. um yeah <laughs> understood everybody hates me <laughs> right, it, it's all cool it's all cool i'm fine thanks how are you guys uh, doing, Fleas, Matt? How are you doing, Matt? Uh, I am doing the absolute batshit craziest thing. My wife and I are selling and buying property. <laughs> We're selling our <laughs> condo and buying a new house. Now, we hmm. had put this plan in place before uh, the COVID-19 stuff. But the amount of stress that we're going through, I, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm an essential worker. Um, I feel really bad. For, there's so many people in trouble and hurting right now all throughout yeah. the world. I, I just, yeah. you know, I'm, I, I see I'm starting to see our podcast and our comic stuff as almost a social service because people need some distractions because the the everything that everyone is going through is just so nuts. And so what the way that we're trying to deal with this stress is we're going, okay, this is stressful. We're selling this, this, our condo, we're buying a house. We got all this other stuff going on, but it could be way freaking worse um, mm. in comparison mm. to a lot of others out there. So that's how, how we're dealing with it. We're just comparing our situation to all of those who are in much worse situations and going, we can do this. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I personally, uh, I'm I'm an essential worker myself, uh, being uh, in the medical field. I'm a medical courier, so I actually do medical courier work for like 53 doctors in my area. Uh, so you're so a I'm hero. Actually, so I'm actually yeah. a first, I'm actually considered a first responder um, because uh, I'm actually handling uh, potential COVID-19 biospecimens to get to lab work for testing and stuff. So so uh, I'm I'm right there in the danger zone of everything with all of that. So. Uh, which is, you know, it has added a little bit of uh, trepidation to my work uh, and things like that. But luckily, everything else going on with me, obviously, I'm still working. So financially, I'm OK. Uh, my my house and everything, I don't have to worry about that. I, li- I have a condo. I own my condo. It's paid for. So I don't have to worry uh-huh. about that. That's uh, good. Which is yeah. great. You know, and I don't have a family. I don't have a wife. I don't have kids. It's just me. I don't even have a pet, mm-hmm. which I know, Matt, you just lost a pet uh, yesterday, yeah. which I know yeah. we're all very sorry for, but I don't even have a pet. So for me, you know, the quarantine, I'm kind of a, a internalizing and unsocial type person, generally speaking, anyway. So I'm used to living alone and being alone. So being made to be at home by myself when I'm not out working doesn't really bother me. So, <laughs> so, so, it, so other than like uh, being just, you know, having to uh, be more careful about what I do and how I do it and, you know, wearing masks and what I touch and washing my hands and all the, all the stuff you need to do to be careful. Other than that, it's not really a whole lot different for me. Yeah. Well, you, uh, obviously your conventions have been put on hold, right? So you're not that traveling is, on. That yeah. is definitely different. Yeah. Cause there are no shows going on. All the shows have either been postponed or canceled altogether. I have a feeling most of the major shows just might well be canceled for the entire year. We will see. Yeah. But I know, San, I know SDCC canceled completely. I know heroes con in June, they canceled completely until next year. 
So there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, it's also it's also interesting to see how uh, local comic shops are reacting to it. So I have a bunch in my area, as do you guys, I'm sure, that I frequent. You know, some have a strong online uh, sales presence, and one I can think of just absolutely does not. He's a, like a sole proprietor, and his doors have just been shuttered for you know three months now or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't imagine how how some of these will you know withstand this. Uh, time it's uh, there, definitely there's, challenging there's definitely a bunch that won't yeah they yeah, just simply won't sad which is very yeah, yeah. Mm. eric how are you coping i'm fine i you know i've been working from home uh it takes a little bit of adjustment but uh you know i've <laughs> i've i feel comfortable with my job which is definitely a huge plus um my company is doing forced pto which you know, so you have to use your time off instead of getting rid of some some headcount. We all just kind of spread about, spread the pain out amongst us all, which I think is definitely a good thing. But you know, the the industry I work on is is longer term, so it's not it's not necessarily uh, market or retail driven or whatever, right? It's you know they're long term federal contracts. So you know, I think I think I'm in good shape, which um, is a good thing. Um, that's very good. Yeah. 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 The only the thing I do want to talk about too is just the nature of you know being quarantined. I'm I'm saving a lot of money not going to the movies. I'm saving a lot of money not going out to eat to dinner. I'm sure you guys are doing the same yeah. if you had those habits, which then makes you think like, oh well, I got X number more dollars in my budget to spend on just you know foreign comics. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to do that just because, you know, this is not a time to be, you know, spending uh, frivolously, right? So it's this weird balance. Plus you're home, you know, in my case, I'm home alone with cats, right? But, you know, it's kind of cool when you get to run in the mailbox and there's something exciting there for you. It's yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you have to sort of to manage the balance of like not overspending and, you know, you know, I'm also donating more to causes that I would don't, you know, normally donate to but in donating more so you know do i should i spend 50 bucks on this or can i apply that 50 dollars to help some other people right so it's just yeah interesting time yeah but yeah and then i have ken's voice on my ear saying if you see it buy it but i'm like these people oh, no. oh I, i'm having to eat my own words at the moment to be honest you know i'm <laughs> i'm sort of seeing something and just going no i can't mm-hmm. do it so i'm yeah. spending sort true. of you know yeah, maybe you know, three to three to five pound a week is my thing at the moment. So, yeah, yeah. You know, spot a book, see it, buy it, but it's only three to five pounds. So, that's it for me at the moment. Yeah, yeah, same. And then, and then we're also seeing a bunch of like uh, posts on Facebook around. If you, I'm sure you guys have seen a bunch of these with the here in America anyway, where they gave out a stimulus to everybody who made less than I think it was seventy five thousand dollars a year. Uh, you got a stimulus of twelve hundred dollars a person, and I think. Five hundred dollars a child, or something like that. Yeah. So you see yeah. a lot of people mm-hmm. posting out their jokey stuff, talking about you know, oh, what did you spend your twelve hundred dollars on? Oh, I went, hello, comics. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, but food. <laughs> but you know, in reality, yeah, you know, we obviously don't recommend people to do that. Um, obviously, not. that money is meant to help you to get through all of this if you're having problems with that. So, mm-hmm. and it's not even enough, I don't think. No, it's really want my honest opinion. It really, is. if you want my honest opinion, I think that there needs to be. Uh, either some kind of guaranteed income or there needs to be a pause, like a pause on all rent, mortgages, mm-hmm. you know, evictions, yeah, everything. everything. Everything needs to be paused. I, I mean, I know that there's a way that it could be done, but I mean, I've done both. it. Yeah. I've done it. Yeah. The first thing I did was um, go to the, the mortgage company and say, hey, I want a payment holiday. Simple as that. I'm not paying you for three yeah. months, you know, and yeah. they agreed. No worries. So yeah. for the next three months, I'm, I'm uh, mortgage free. I'm gonna pass. Yeah, there needs my, to be. Uh, I'm gonna pass yeah. along my landlord's phone number to you, Ken. Uh, the sim- yeah. To me, the simplest way to do that, I'll just throw this out there. To me, the simplest way to do that is just simply say, "Hey, you know, you don't have to pay for this many months here while this is going on," and basically, we'll just make that out like it never happened, it wasn't there, and instead, we'll yeah. add that four or five months, let's say whatever it is, onto the end. Of the loan, of the loan, so yeah. You just pay it. So your loan's just yeah. going to take longer to pay off, but for this amount of time, you don't have to pay anything. We just add it on to the end. 
Yeah, it's like a pause. It's like yeah, you it's go a to pause. Exactly. and hit the pause button. Right. Yeah. And yep. and and you know, because they're saying, well, what about the landlords? And I say, no, the landlords shouldn't pay it either. Just pause it. Yeah. Mm. Pause and, life for three months at least. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, what we need is the political will. And you know, I I don't want to get into politics, though. No, it's please. interesting because Phantom Us is all about politics. Mm. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's I don't know, guys. It, yeah. it, it is it's scary and. Um, we're lucky that we are in the situations that we are. And I just, I just want to tell you too, though, Stephen, you are a hero. Thank you for being on the front lines of this thing here in America. Um, and, uh, I totally honor you, my friend, for yeah, that. Yeah. That's yeah. And yeah. no problem. I appreciate it, guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, we, we do have a topic that we wanted to get into, which was came from a question last time around, but, before we get into that, I just wanted to plug a couple things. The first one is is the Anchor app that we're, that we're on. It's a free podcasting service. Uh, Ken is sort of our technical uh, master on the on the platform, but yeah, Anchor is free um, to uh, publish information. It's it it goes a long way with uh, corporate media giants for us to be able to get our voices out there through a free platform like Anchor. So. Kudos to Anchor for hosting our uh, mm-hmm. our uh, silly little podcast here. Um, I, I don't mean silly, but uh, you know what I'm saying. Um, and uh, I also wanted to make mention of Morton F. Thompson, uh, his talking foreign videos, talking foreign with Morton on YouTube. Uh, they just started popping up, and God, they are awesome. <laughs> he does these. Uh, yeah, he does these deep dive on Norwegian comics. Yeah, talk a little bit about that, Matt. Who who is Morton and 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 Morton is Morton Thompson is probably as far at least as far as I know one of the most hardcore comic book related guys out of Norway. He's a collector. He's been collecting, you know, since he was young. He uh has his own con, if you can believe that. Mm. He basically runs his own comic con there in Norway. Um he's Fluent in English, he I don't know how many more, uh, more other languages the guy probably speaks. But when it comes to Norwegian comics and Nordic comics in general, now um, you know the Nordic countries there in Europe, we kind of know kind of experts from each region. Um, and Morton is by far the top Norwegian guy that we know, and his his videos are are amazing. They're just deep dives into you know. Marvel or DC in a specific, you know, in the Bronze Age in Norway or, or, I mean, name it, pick, pick the topic and how it happened there in Norway. And he knows it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are even faintly interested in foreign comics, go check out his YouTube channel. You will not be disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Ken? Well, I've, I've known Morton a, a while. And I, um, I've only got to say that um, he's also one of the nicest men in comics. Yes. One of the nicest characters. I mean, everybody's pretty nice to lesser or more degrees, but Morton is super nice. He's a great guy. I've got a lot of time, a lot of respect for him. He's a, he's a super fella. Good chap. Yeah. And he's invited us to his con. You know, <laughs> of all of us, I think that um, uh, you can probably would be the easiest to just take a, a flight, hop, you know, hop on over over there. But yeah, That's he's mm-hmm. he's made like an open invitation. Any of the foreign guys, you somehow make your way to to to, to Norway during the time of his con. Will be it, the way he made it seem to me is almost like we'd be guests of honor or something. I love that. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, Unbelievable. What I mean, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, the thing is, I will more than likely take Morton up on that offer, and I will also hit up Randall Cinnamon on the way. Oh yes, yes, oh, yeah. for you sure. Know, me, Randall, and Morton will head off, and uh, hopefully see you all there. Right yeah, I would love to do it. I would love because he he was talking about us doing like a, uh, uh, oh God, I can't talk, I can't think right now, guys. You know, where you you uh, you sit in the front and people watch it and ask questions. Panel, what the yeah, hell like, a, is... like a panel, a panel. Yeah, yeah. sorry, <laughs> my, my brain's a little fried. Um, but yeah, he was talking about uh, it would be neat if we all did a panel at his con because you know we take for granted that people know about this grand international back issue marketing, but a lot of people don't. So a lot of those people going to the Norwegian con would probably be real surprised that there's uh, a guy from the UK, a couple of Americans, some people from other parts of Europe, <laughs> all interested in Norwegian comics. I mean, cool. that, that, that's super cool. Yeah. 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 Very neat. 
Yeah, so go check him out on uh, Talking Foreign with Morton on YouTube. I think if you search that, he should come up. If you see a dude wearing a uh, Pac-Man uh, sports blazer, that'd be him. That's which is, him. Yeah. Which is bad, <laughs> badass on, a, on another level. Uh, yeah. And let me put a question to you, Matt. Um, it's it's been probably you know six weeks or more since we recorded here. Any you know, I guess quarantine has had a big impact on the market. Any trends or any things that you have noticed that you want to? Yes. Surface? Yes. Um, trend wise, with the market, the market is exploding, guys. We are seeing record sales all over the place, and for all types of books, whether they be bootlegs, whether they be um, non canons whether they be you know foreign keys whether you name it we're seeing explosive growth and i think i don't know if it's directly related to the quarantine i think some of it is because as you know guys as we're quarantined it can't go do those things like like you like you stated so very well eric you can't go to the movies you can't do this you can't do that you might as well be on freaking ebay or or researching or or doing that on, on stuff that you like and we're seeing guys on, you know, Comic Tom, uh, Simple Man's comics. All the CBSI guys are really talking foreigns now. It's the word is getting out there, and as that word gets out there, we're seeing explosive growth in the hobby. Um, so it's, you know, if you're looking for deals on on foreign books on American eBay, they're be, they're drying up, guys. I mean, I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but. Now, if you're gonna if you're trying to find good deals on books, you really got to go into the weeds to find them now, guys. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah, if you yeah. guys have noticed that. Um, so it is, you know, market wise, trend wise, I think foreigns are kind of we're what do you what's that saying where you're uh, kind of the bell of the ball? We are getting noticed, and we're all dressed up in a nice, sexy dress. And everyone is looking. You've been looking through my wardrobe again, my face. <laughs> I have. I, I, those sexy black dresses with fishnet stockings, Ken. I, those are they. You know, the, th that's what's happening now is a lot of people within the hobby. And it's not just American. You know, when I speak about this, I'm not just talking about American-centric. I'm talking about collectors all over the world mm. seeking mm. this material out, this foreign material out, this material that is not – um, you know, indigenous to them and spending real money on it, guys. Yeah. That is probably the biggest news, I think. Yeah, yeah it's it's yeah. funny. Uh, let me throw something in here on that too, because I'm, I'm remember when when this whole thing with the the lockdowns and the COVID and all this stuff first started happening, there was a lot of stuff going out there. I was seeing on Facebook and on other stuff where it was talking about how oh, this could be a a major downgrade to the value of comics because you know. People aren't going to be they're going to be focused on other things and, you know, they're not going to be wanting to spend money. And, you know, the, so you're going to see people start to sell comics for cheaper than they were selling before because they need money and yada, yada. yada. And all of that kind of made sense at the time. But mm. what I've seen and like Matt says here is that actually people being made to it's like you're being locked down. So now you're not spending money out there doing the things you would normally be doing whether it's go out to eat, go out to the movies, like mass, whatever it is, a lot of that stuff is gone. So that mm -hmm. money is not being spent. So now you're stuck. You're in your home a lot more. You're not going out, even if you still have a job, because a lot there are people out there who still have their work. Um, yeah. So they may have their work, but they're not going out to spend their money mm -hmm. as much anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. as a result, they're at home when they're not at work. And they've got more money to spend because they're not out spending it. They're at home not spending it. So as a result, they're on, like Matt says, they're out. They're on their computer more. They're on the internet more. They're on eBay. They're doing research. They're looking around at the things they're interested in. So the people interested in comics are looking more into comics. And now they have actually more money to spend because they're not spending it out by going out and doing things. Right. Right. Mm. Yeah, and, yeah, they're yeah, and they're finding foreigns and they're finding foreigns in the and, process yeah and they're fine and they're you know and, and um something that I, i'd like to bring up too is that uh and we're gonna go over this on a on a tales from the flip side uh at some point we've planned it already but you know one of the things about the comic hobby right now is that the speculative game and the key game and the following you know the movies and figuring out you know which books are going to become hot and whatnot 
it's changed to the point where everyone is an insider now. You've got literally got comic book shops that the book hasn't even come out yet. Mm-hmm. And the comic book shop gets, gets their, their order from Diamond, and they immediately go and they research and see which of those new books are going to be hot. And in some instances, not all, I'm not going to say all uh, LCSs are evil, but in some instances, they don't even go out for, the, for, the, for the, uh, the list price. They might put out 10 books for the actual cover price, maybe to satisfy some requirement, and then they, they hoard a, a, an amount, and then those immediately go out for 30 40 50 60 mm-hmm. 70 dollars the dollar bin digging that people used to do, it's not – I mean, you really have to be so lucky in order to get those deals again. There is only one place in the hobby where it, you, know, you can get in as early as you can and you can find these really true novel gems and find books for cheap that have this possibility for this exponential monetary growth or popularity, and that is in foreigns. Mm-hmm. So – you know, I think what's happening is you've got a lot of these guys that have been been playing in the whole kind of spec game um, and doing the whole dollar bin, you know, jewel treasury finds and stuff. And they're they're looking at the at the foreign market part of the hobby and going, that is brand new. That is still early. They're still, you know, I'd say as much as 70 to 80 percent of the hobby has not caught up yet. That is one place where I can put my money into and I can get into it early and not only possibly see a return later on down the line, but get amazing books and be able to walk into any com- you know, local comic shop and show them stuff that they've never seen before. Mm-hmm. We are in the foreign part of this hobby. Like I said, we're the bell of the ball. We are just that kind of – we're attracting. Everyone's got – has their eyes on us now. And I think – I think a lot of dealers are looking at it that way. I think a lot of even comic journalists, um, everyone is starting to look at it, guys, and it's, it's mm. exciting. Yeah. yeah plus, there's, there's there's element of uh, there's this element of <clears throat> like new collecting new comics is one thing, but chasing those smaller run incentive books, the variants that are for a particular convention with an alternate cover and et cetera, like that is that's pricey, right? That's, mm-hmm. you know, that's expensive and it, it's, it's off putting. Like there, you know, there are variants that I would like to get, but they're, you know, am I going to spend whatever, a hundred dollars plus for that variant book? That's like a month old or, yeah. You know, and, and it still is a new book, nothing against new books, but they don't, you know, they don't have that old book smell, no. you know, that old, this is, right. This is exactly. That's what gets me every time. Yeah. So, it's, you know, it's for me, it's more rewarding to collect the old books, just increasing the scope of, you know, what was contemporaneous at the time, meaning foreigns versus, you know, spending an over, you know, spending too much for an overpriced uh, minimum run variant. Right. It's way yeah. cool to have like, you know, check it out. I have the first appearance of you know, whoever from Italy, right? That's so much cooler from 1970 something, right? That's so much cooler yeah. than, you know, the, you know, the limited edition, uh, you know, um, J. Scott Campbell, eight variants that were, you know, X number of dollars a piece, right? Like that, when you get that in your hand, like the art is cool, but it doesn't, it just doesn't have that, old, like I said, I can't describe it any better than that. It doesn't have that old book smell to it. It doesn't have that feel. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's not a right. Greek. It's not a Greek Black Panther run. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You know what I mean. You, yeah. you know what I mean. It, it's not. It it has no novelty. I mean, I guess it does. It does have some novel value, but in comparison, you know, when you you bust out like you showed on our show on Global Comic Safari, um, you know, it's just not the same. It's not going to compare to, like I said, a Cabanas Hellas Black Panther Greek run. It just it's you're right you're you're exactly right yeah i'll tell, tell you what guys i'm gonna get a lot of my uh, books sent to me directly it works i'm there all the damn time so whenever i get a new book it's like a, it's like a christmas present so i immediately set up the cam put my microphone in and start <laughs> recording for, for youtube and i've lost count the amount of times i've caught myself on camera flicking through the pages and just getting that that adult smell of old newspaper print (laughs) and it's like oh that's my that's my adult senses going wild for this particular thing (laughs) that's enough yeah you think you're a 15 year old with a playboy seeing a playboy for the first time (laughs) hell yeah yeah 
<laughs> you know, I had an I had an idea. We were talking about market trends. This just kind of came to me now. Uh, you were talking, Matt, about you know it being something of a buyer's market and exploding and stuff. And you know, anecdotally, there are books that we know that are are keys, right? The non-canon Spider-Man books, uh, you know, mm -hmm. black costume Spider-Man books. There's, you know, you know uh, those various Batman books. There are key foreign books that we can look at going up or down to get a gauge of the overall um, health of the market or growth of the market, right? And that got me yeah. thinking the, the way they do that, in business, I used to work for Dow Jones as the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right? Um, which is published every day in the Wall Street Journal. They take a cross section of stocks, you know, utilities, uh, food, whatever, right? That, that in in aggregate are indicative of the health of the market, right? That's what the Dow Jones and they sort of boil them all down to an average number. Here's a number. This is the health of the market generally. Mm -hmm. Right, goes up and down. Right, that's what the Dow Jones yep. average is. Um, I wonder if there's any value in doing that for, you know, identifying, you know, let's say, uh, thirty key books across ten key countries, and mathematically mm -hmm. coming up with an industrial, a foreign comics industrial average, much like the Dow Jones industrial average, where, you know, based on recent sales, uh, you know, which would be a result of the climate we're in or not in, right? It would go up or down, yeah. right? Over time, you would then see trends like, oh, like right now, the Spider-Man non-canons, just from what I know, they go for roughly $200 a pop, something like that, right? But I imagine two years ago, they might have been $100 a pop or $80 a pop. Mm -hmm. Two years from now, they might be $400 a pop, right? So if we had an, yeah. an average mathematically, we could track those over time. Anybody good at math? Yeah. I, I, I think that's a, that that would be extremely valuable. But this is there's another part to that equation that's tough, and it's like what we've talked about before in the past: the difference between the greater international back issue market and then the local indigenous markets individually. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's it, you'd almost have to kind of factor in both. I'll, I'll give you an example. My buddy Cecilio in Mexico, he recently bought a non-canon. Right? Do you know how much he paid for it? Guess. Mm. Eight dollars. He paid no eight dollars. Eight dollars. <laughs> <laughs> because still in, in within the back issue of Mexico, there are still collectors there that don't know what's happening to them and still consider them trash. Right? Mm. So, you know, though that, that issue that made the non canons rare in the first place is still there. Okay. You're, you're you're there's still um non canons being sold in Mexico for pennies on the dollar of what they'd sell on American eBay. Um, so it, it's complicated. You know, we've talked about, there, there are people, uh, Tim Bildhauser, uh, a CBCS expert, he keeps a running track of certain books mm, okay. um, and he monitors sales and stuff. But okay. I think what, I think your idea is great. What would be awesome is if we had some kind of clearinghouse for that data. You know, mm -hmm. we've talked about this before too. We would need basically a, a, a you know, a web developer to be able to develop some kind of system where people could go in and input sales. Those sales could then be looked at maybe by some kind of administrators that could go, yeah, that's an accurate sale. I know that that's real mm -hmm. so that people yeah. couldn't put in fake stuff and manipulate the market. Right. And then, but who, th this gets us back to that issue. Like what we were talking about, Ken, um, mm. about, uh, you know, we did it all. We've tried it all. We've tried a database. We've tried a website. We, we've done it all. We've done and eventually all. <laughs> it ends up falling apart because people only have so much time. Yeah. It's only as good as the information that's in there. Yeah. 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 Um, I like, I mean, it's idea. also, I, it's also, I like think a, it's a, great. I think it's a Go fantastic ahead, sorry. idea. Yeah. No, no worries. No worries. I think it's a fantastic idea, but we've also got to think that, um, maybe that window where the indigenous population, you know, those books are two a penny, so to speak. But I think that window is going to be closing True. in the future when they start to wake <laughs> up and think, oh, my book, that's worth a lot more money to other people. And, you know, those books in value, they're going to yep. go up. And it's all, surely. yeah, we're seeing oh, yeah. Yeah. American and international money go into these uh, back issue markets and freak them out. Very oftentimes, they don't know what yeah. or why. Or, you know, I've told that story about the Italian 300 many times. You know, the Italian collectors had no idea what was going on. Mm. Still, many of them still 
don't have any idea. They think they're being ripped off. So, you know, another interesting topic for the future that I'd like to, like you like to say, Eric, put a pin in it, is are we going to see backlash from that? Um, you know, eventually there's going to be nationalistic attitudes that will prevail a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's almost, I, I, I thought about it like, almost like mm. comic colonialism or comic, um, you know, what, it, what, it, what is that going to do well, to yeah. these back issue markets when these, you know, it's already happening in French Canada. I've, this is another story I've told you guys about. There are a lot of exactly. French Canadian yeah. collectors yeah. that hate, absolutely hate the fact. Now, to them, they call it spoiled brat Americans, but, you know, I, I, I don't think a lot of them realize that a lot of other collectors uh, are picking up those EH books. But they absolutely hate that their books were found and have, have become things that other people want and will pay big money for it. And, you know, you have some French Canadian collectors that say, I will not sell to someone that is not a French Canadian collector. And the reason is, you know, their, yeah. their whole thing is about a lot of them building runs, right. Or upgrading their books and runs. And what's happened to that Iron Man 55 or the, or the Spidey 129 for a lot of French collectors, if they don't have the EH Iron Man 55 or the Spider-Man 129, if they want it, they're going to have to spend an exorbitant amount of money to get it because of that demand on the greater international market. And what does that bitterness do? And how does that play into nationalistic tendencies? And how do we, you know, so that is going to be a way more complex uh, topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately for, you know, you, you lovely guys, you Americans, you're going to have to use like a third party, like a, a or something, because <laughs> we're already <laughs> seeing it in some places, you know, uh, yeah. there was a non-canon, uh, the Gwen, the, the wedding issue. Uh, it was, uh, there was up on an auction on Facebook and it was in one of the Mexican groups and there were people outside of Mexico bidding on that. And a Mexican won it for, mm. I think it was about seven or $800. If you transferred the pesos into dollars, it'd be seven or $800. And a lot of the Mexican collectors were, they were thrilled that the book stayed in Mexico, right? Already. It's cool. That's I cool, like though. it. But what I'm saying is already you're starting to see little rumblings of, of, of uh, indigenous collectors going, do we really want our comic history to leave our borders? You know, and I, I tell, you know, that's a weird. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, though, it, if the price is right, you know, the scenario you just described was, you know, a reaction to a, a local person yeah. winning via bid. Yes. Someone else could have outbid them, you know what I mean? And it may have not have never even been a thought, right? I don't know. I, I think I haven't had any issues with Canadian uh, dealers at all. As long as you spell color with a U, <laughs> we're, we're right? yes. you, you see, that's fine for me. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And as long as when you say, uh, you know, aluminium. Aluminium, yeah, that's what you hear. <laughs> you know? Aluminium, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Controversy. <laughs> Right, the controversy uh, instead of controversy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we have the question that we wanted to address that we left as a bit of a cliff cliffhanger on the last episode was from uh, Maria Elisa, and she asked us about uh, non-U.S. superhero titles, and I think we each declared that we were going to take one or a region of the world or a hero or something like that, and do a little bit of research and do a little bit of show and tell. Um, I think I think Matt, you got the you might have the sexiest one, at least the, the, the your most passionate in your delivery. So let's let's save you as a okay. best for last, and let's go. Let's, <laughs> I think you're gonna, I think you're you're just chomping at the bit to I'll bust wait, out of the I'll gate. Be good. So, I'll sit on my hands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, right. before we start to record you're like oh i can't wait to say you know so best for last uh let's let's go around the table uh fleas who did you which hero did you want to talk about and from where and, and you want to give us a little bit of history uh i decided because i've actually seen a couple of copies um, of these around and i was really curious about it, so i kind of did a little bit of research into the character himself and one of the first uh countries outside of the u.s to really start to try to make waves into creating their own superheroes that I know of was Brazil. Um, 
Uh, there might have been some before that, but uh, Brazil has a huge uh, category of their own superheroes. Um, you know, of course, obviously they did this stuff from America, like Superman and uh, even the old like uh, uh, Submariner and Human Torch and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, all that stuff from way back then. Um, but they have a huge gamut of characters um, that they actually created on their own. Um, the one that, that kind of struck me that I saw was a character called Capitao Seven, or Captain Seven, mm. as we would call him here. Capitao mm. Seven. Uh, I saw a couple of issues, and I was like, you know, that, that looks interesting. What is that? You know, so I kind of did a little research, and it turns out that um, uh, Capitao Seven actually started as a television program uh, mm. in 1954. Mm. Um, and it was a guy who, uh, and forgive me, anything I say not being the correct pronunciation, uh, but the actor who played this character in the, sh- in the show, uh, the actor's name was um, Aris Campos, Arias Campos, C-A-M-P-O-S. And uh, mm-hmm. basically, he was originally created as sort of a Flash Gordon style type character. Um, he was really strong. Um, he could do a lot of different things. He had a ray gun, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that was in 54. That television show lasted until 1966. Wow. So it lasted okay. for quite a while. Um, yeah. yeah. But uh, what happened was it started as a, sh- as a television show. And the reason he was called Capital 7 was because the record or the record, which was this television station that did this, the television station was station number seven hmm. or channel <laughs> seven. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they decided to name him, you know, Captain Seven. He's the captain of our station, you know, kind of a thing, you know. Marketing. That's, that's marketing. It was basically marketing. Um, they even went further <laughs> with it in some of the storyline with the character. But what happened was the way the character started out in 54, in 1959, they decided to come out with a comic book of the character. And when they decided to come out with this comic book of this character, he suddenly became a Superman hmm. type. Hmm. A lot of his stuff is similar to Superman. He has some things that are different, hmm. though. Um, uh, for example, uh, I'm just going through my stuff here. Uh, he's able to fly. He's able to go with great speed. Uh, he has super strength, and he's practically invulnerable. So yeah. all of those are Superman-like qualities. Uh, very, very basic to Superman. Um, and his I'll mother's name, sorry to interrupt, and his mother's name is Martha. So they're <laughs> yeah. to be a friend with uh, right. Batman. Well, <laughs> here's, the, here's where some of the differences come. Superman came from another planet. He was basically an alien. He came from Krypton to Earth. And because of the, the way the atmosphere and environment was in Krypton, he wound up being a super person, superhuman here on Earth. This guy, Captain Seven, Capital Seven, he was, an, he was Earth. He was human on Earth. And he was taken by aliens to another planet hmm. and there he Brilliant. gained these abilities and then came back to earth and That's he has cool. the ability to go hmm. back and forth he can go yeah. back to and it's called the seventh planet of course interesting so, <laughs> he can go back and forth yeah he can go back and forth to these yeah, planets yeah. and everything but there's a lot of things that are similar uh other than that uh or not similar for example the only reason he has his powers is if he wears his suit he has to be wearing his outfit or the powers just don't have hmm. their full effect. And he keeps his powers. He keeps his suit scrunched up into a tiny little uh, matchbox. <laughs> it's in a little matchbox. <laughs> like, so it fits with. inside a, yeah. a, a yeah. So, little like flesh so ring. With, through some kind of magic, it becomes tiny, yeah, tiny, tiny. tiny like in his pocket? <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. So It's like the flash ring. Remember Flash had his suit in his ring? It's like the... The same vendor sold the uh, Capital <laughs> yeah. Seven. And- yeah, oh, that's cool. Yeah, and and the other and he uh, basically he has an alter ego. He's a brilliant scientist in the civilian world. So like where Superman was a newspaper reporter, this guy was a brilliant scientist, a chemist. In fact, a brilliant chemist. So, and his Lois Lane, and Superman has Lois Lane. He has a he has a woman named Silvana. And Silvana, basically, throughout the course of the series and the show and whatever else, she becomes his wife. And at first, his identity is still kept secret from her. But eventually, he reveals his, his identity to her. And eventually, she wow. even goes to the seventh planet 
gains some of the same powers, comes back with him, and they become sort of a oh, that's hero cool. couple. So it would be like if Lois Lane went to Krypton and was lived there for a long time, came back and had all the powers of Superman, and, and Superman and Lois were both super couple. You know, that's mm. basically that the idea is kind of what they did. So that was oh, kind of yeah. interesting. And the, but of course, after the comics came out, the ray gun kind of went away. Uh, that went away because that was more of a Flash Gordon type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, the comic lasted for about 40 issues, is my understanding. Uh, ended in 1964, I believe, before the show, TV show even ended. So the TV show originally, they, they didn't have the kind of money back in the early 50s uh, to have to do the kind of effects that would have made him more hmm. Superman-like. Uh, so that's why when they came out with the comic, they changed it. And then, of course, the TV show kind of changed with it as it went along. Uh, so, yeah, so it was real interesting. And um, there was something else on this, too. Like some of the villains that he had to go up against were real interesting, too. So, you know, they had the, had the character called the uh, the Skull. The Skull was one of his main arch nemesis. You know, <laughs> he uh, basically got electrified in a fence that completely destroyed his face. Uh, because of an encounter with Capital 7, and so he wound up swearing vengeance against him, and, you know, so he basically became an arch villain against him there, and, but he also had a bunch of villains that were basically scientists, mad scientists, evil genius, those are the kind of uh, characters that they would put up against him, you know, so, but, uh, yeah, he was just really, really interesting, and uh, the more I looked into this, I was just like, you know, yeah, this is really neat. Uh, it, It it said, it said in one section I saw there, because I haven't really read through all of these, uh, read through the books or looked through the books or anything, but apparently uh, he has to constantly go back to uh, the planet because he needs to bathe in these rays of invulnerability. Huh. <laughs> uh, so, like, a lot of his powers are based on bathing through these rays of invulnerability and having on his suit. So he has these abilities, but only under certain conditions. So he has to make sure mm. those conditions are in place or he doesn't have his powers, you know? So that's kind of, that's a little different from Superman who is just Superman. He is what he is. And doesn't matter if he goes out fighting crime mm. both naked yeah. or whether he has his outfit on, <laughs> he's still going to be Superman. If you can fire a gun at him, you're not, it's going to bounce off his chest whether he's wearing something or not. So, so yeah. You see, you see Matt, like be naked. Like <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you know, it, I, I, my conversion uh, is well, thinking about, you know, if him and his wife both have these superpowers, you know, what, what does her sex life look like? It's got to be, well, well, I guess if he has yeah. to be wearing his suit. Hey, no. Right? Oh, my. So if he only has his power when he's in his That's suit. That's true. Right. Then I guess their sex life is just normal. <laughs> but, 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 you know, what's neat about right. that is unlike, you know, well, Superman has uh, uh, kryptonite, of course. But I could see him getting into some real interesting mm-hmm. scrapes where villains can get his clothes off him. You know he's in trouble, right? <laughs> Get him, undress him, right? Undress him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, well, like one of the one of the, one of the villains, uh, Doctor Corvus, which was a mad scientist from the Seventh Planet, where he got these powers. Uh, he he created a chemical weapon. It gave him the power to like hypnotize people, or uh, and, like psychically strike people with his eyes using the power of his thought. You know, things like that. So that that's the kind of thing that they would uh, throw up. One another one, uh evil genius uh Dr. Solano. Dr. Solano uh had like a robotic a robotic army and uh, actually exchanged bodies at one point with the father of Sylvana hmm. Capital's wife, wow. who who is a scientist mm-hmm. himself. A scientist okay. himself. He actually somehow took over his body. You know, and so there was a lot of, you know, craziness that went on with that. So, yes. Uh, what Now, the other thing that's neat about this is as time went on, even after the show ended, you would still see appearances of this character here and there throughout things through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, even into the 2000s. And the actor who played him in the TV show died in 2003. And when he died all of the copyrights and ownership and licensing ownerships of the character went to his children. So his children Hmm. own those copyrights. So anything that's done with the character has to go through and be approved by uh, the children of the actor. That's what, that's what's different about this too, with some of the stuff here in America. In America, we create a character in a comic 
and Marvel owns the rights to that character. Disney owns hmm. the rights now to that yeah. character. Whereas here, the actor who played that character on TV before it was even a comic owned the rights to the character even in the comic store in any other format that you would put him into. Yeah, I wonder if it's possible maybe he created like Captain Kangaroo or something like that, you know, Mr. Rogers or, you know, something like that stateside that we know. Like maybe mm -hmm. if it was a TV show first, maybe he was an actor that got hired to do something and he was had a hand in creating it there by owning it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so who, interesting. Yeah, who, yeah. who published those books? Were they Ebel? Is that the Brazilian publisher? Uh, the books were published by, hang on here, I've got it down here. And do you have any of them? Uh, I do not. I'm actually, actually going to look into getting something because I've seen a few and that's what kind of got me interested in uh, researching on cool. to find out what this was. But the comics were started in 1959 uh, by Continental. Hmm. Continental hmm. Uh, publisher. Uh, I, I, I even have like names of the people who designed it, uh, the artists, the whole nine yards, you know, but, you know, but yeah, they... It, it, it's neat. And if you ever see any of these around where you see Capital 7 um, from back in the, the day, from back then, they're, they're really cool looking. They're cool looking covers. Uh, very neat. Uh, you can even kind of see some of the pro progress of the characters throughout the issues. Because like with issue one, you see you see Capital 7 and you see Silvana, But Silvana just looks like a normal, ordinary woman. But then later mm -hmm. on, once you get into like issue seven, eight, whatever, all of a sudden, Silvana is done up kind of like Capital 7. You know, she looks like a superhero type now, too, which is, of course, the, what eventually mm. would happen with her. So. Very cool. That's cool. That's awesome. Mm. Is it is it 7, like the Roman numeral 7, like or the numeric? No, no it's the numeric 7. It, it's, it's, numeric the numeric seven. it's the English. It's the English okay, 7. So it's not, yeah. Okay, he, he's got so a, it could be like Capital H or something in he's Portuguese. He's got a case and his outfit and a suit and whole nine yards and a yeah. big and a big. That was my next question. Chest, was you know? what was what did oh, his cool. chest logo? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. seven. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It had, he 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 kind of looks like Superman. The coloring's a little different. He does have a cape, uh, but instead mm. of like underoo type, you know, bottoms to it and everything, it, it looks almost more like sort of a pants, almost mm. more like pants. Um, but, yeah. but, but it is, a, but you can look at it and say, oh yeah, that's a super, that's a superhero. You know, he's got a superhero type look to him, you know? Yeah. When, whenever I see Capto 7, I always, um, think, yeah, that's a definite Superman yeah. lookalike. Yeah. But also, I, I'd I think say, he looks I, a bit like Marvel What I've seen yeah. him too, yeah. I've kind of yeah. thought Marvel man. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, they were yeah. just, I think they were just cool basically trying costume. to create a Superman type but wanted to throw in enough differences to differentiate him, mm. you know, from that so that it was, you know, not, you know, but I mean, it didn't really matter down there. They could have just made him exactly like Superman and, yeah. you know, DC wouldn't have cared. Uh, yeah. I mean, how, how they could I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. Yeah. DC wouldn't have cared. But... And how he evolved from that too. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, yeah. he started out as more like a sci-fi flash Gordon type. And then, as the comic book came out, yeah. he morphed into more interesting. Of a yeah, it, it always that it always reeks to me like someone, like a boss, a cigar smoking boss who's kind of out of touch. He's like, ah, the kids like this Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon stuff. Give me one of them. And then mm -hmm. a couple years later, kids are like in this uh, Superman thing. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, seven into something like that, right? So yeah, yeah. They're chasing a trend, you know. Pretty it, much. Yeah. You know. Pretty much. Yeah, very that's cool. Awesome. That's awesome. That's cool. Awesome. That's a cool one. Uh, any other questions or comments on Capital Seven, or do we want to move on to uh, Ken? I think you're next. What do you got? Right. Well, I did want to major on a homegrown hero. Kinda. Okay. With the UK split into four major regions, you have obviously England, you have Scotland, you have Wales, and at the moment you have Northern Ireland. So mm -hmm. the obvious thing for me was to go for Captain Britain, <laughs> but no, that's just that's just too easy. So <laughs> it is. So <clears throat> thinking thinking kind of laterally, I live in the heart of England, slightly to the west, and it's called the Midlands. So funnily enough, hmm. there's a guy called Captain Midlands, and I thought, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Cool. he's the one for me. <laughs> I'm down with that. 
Does he have an accent or something? Is there a Midland accent? Yeah, no, he hasn't at all. No, he's a typical cock, cock and a London, which he shouldn't be. He should be really talking like this, you know. Like <laughs> so, um, I mean, I could have gone to the 2000 AD stable because most of their UK heroes are slain, but he comes from Ireland and it's like all, all over the place. I thought, no, 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 Captain Midlands, 40 odd miles from where I live, Birmingham. Yeah, that'll do me. So, yeah, Captain Midlands, um, he's a modern hero. Hmm. His real name is Rambling Sid Ridley. Brilliant. <laughs> Created by um, Paul Cornell, who did some of uh, the Doctor Who comics and TV series, to be fair. Uh, penciled by a guy called, I'm probably going to rubbish this name up. I'd like to call him Trevor Hairsign, but it could, could be Trevor Hairsigny. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm going to go with Trevor Hairsign. First appeared in uh, US Marvel. Wisdom number mm. one. So, um, basically, mm. the British equivalent of Cap. Oh. Mm. Okay. Um, gained his powers through the British Super Soldier program. <laughs> Sounds like that. <laughs> but he wasn't frozen in ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar but different. Wasn't frozen in ice mm. in age normally. So, Captain Midlands served with the British Secret Agency MI13. And after the Scroll invasion protected the protected the UK from basically mundane petty criminals, so dull, boring tasks. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Completely dull. So this is different. This is a different type of superhero I'm bringing you guys. You see? He is different. Rambling. The Queen different. would be proud. <laughs> but he, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't she just? Wouldn't she just? Now the thing with oh. Rambling Sid Ridley is that he turned traitor. Oh no! Uh-oh. Oh no! Yeah, 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 yeah. He battled uh, Doctor Strange's old enemy, old nemesis, the Mindless Ones. And um, basically they captured him. He was outnumbered and they turned him traitor. Cutting it short-ish, he was caught, imprisoned, awaiting trial. And unfortunately, our rambling Sid Ridley's end came to a rather sticky end. (laughs) Yeah. While he's awaiting trial, terrible. Pete Wisdom, head of MI13, put a gun into Captain Midland's cell. Oh, the wow. Captain, the ultimate sacrifice. So, guys, rather than, <laughs> rather than spend the rest of his life rotting away in a jail cell. Of he took care of it himself. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely. But I don't think we ever heard the gunshot or saw it drawing panel. But he hmm. hasn't been seen since 2007. Hmm. Hmm. That, kind of, that kind of reminds me of uh, Vigilante. Vigilante yeah. committed suicide at the end of uh, his series. Interesting. So Captain Midland could still be out there. Captain Midland. Well, maybe he. Returned. Yeah, maybe. I've got maybe it was going. all a, a trick. <laughs> like the... Maybe he didn't kill himself. <laughs> maybe it's like he's like a, the, a Jeffrey Epstein, and he's on some. He's on some <laughs> island somewhere. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You never know. You never know. I like that he was in charge of uh, <laughs> menial crimes, like he was doing. Uh, yeah, he, boring. He's giving parking, parking tickets. You, know, parking. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah, Midlands hero, yeah. Midlands crime. The little like kids. That. There's Captain Midlands. Look, he's giving that car a ticket. <laughs> You're not having that ice cream. <laughs> if you tore a tag off your mattress, Captain Midlands would show up to oh, dispense man, justice. That's great. What a great exactly. One. Punish the jaywalkers. Truth, oh, justice, and the, <laughs> as truth, justice, and the exceedingly oh, man, that's, British way. That's good. Mm. <laughs> and you, and that's the that's the area that you're from, Ken. So does he? Is he um, is yeah. Proud to have him as a. Midlanders. <laughs> we're, we're all pride Midlanders. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, just, just think of it, though. I mean, okay, Midlander. Mm-hmm. We've heard of the Northerners, okay? We've heard of the Northerners. We have the Southerners. But you never hear of the Easterners, right? oh, a separate TV series. Mm, yeah. Or the Westland, the Midlander. Westlanders. True. Yeah, think on mm. that, Midlander. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is me. So uh, I hope you yeah, enjoyed that little that. Story about rambling Sydney. Oh, and can I say that also <laughs> after the it. podcast, Good. I'd like for us all to show some covers and images of all these guys. I think that would be great on the 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking we about doing that. We need anyway, to do yeah. that mm. for sure. Good idea. Sure. Yeah. 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 Good idea. <laughs> well, the, the best thing for you guys to do is to send me the images you want to you. Okay. Cool. And yeah. then I will put it on the YouTube channel. Yeah, that would oh, be awesome. Cool. Cool. That'll work. Great. 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 Yeah, cool. Great. No problem. So uh, I think I'm up next, saving Matt as the last one. I'm going to, the one I was interested in is, and maybe you guys have heard of this, mm, is Mighty yeah. Man from South Africa. Mm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in South African comics for a bunch of reasons. Uh, I'm dying to get my hands on some super comics, but uh, Mighty Man was published by a company called Afri Comics. And he was labeled as the human law enforcing dynamo uh, ran from 75 to maybe 77. I didn't get a clear picture on how many issues, but uh, it, it's such an interesting story because it, it essentially mm-hmm. was a piece of propaganda, right? So um, mighty man was sort of propaganda for the sort of any uprising in the black population and his character, the character of Mighty Man was, his basic uh, basic message was to follow the law without question. Yeah. Of course, the laws of apartheid, right? And he was a, mm. he was a black superhero in the vein of Superman. And, you know, he had blue tights, kind of a yellow belt, you know, red cape with a big collar on. He had like a red mask where, but the top of his head was out, kind mm. of like Black Goliath or something, right? And red gloves and red. But it was started by the secretary of the Department of Information, which is always if, if you ever have a Department of Information, yeah. that's probably a bad start um, in the South Africa. <laughs> uh, the guy, the guy's name was Eshel Rudy, and it was again, it was essentially created to protect apartheid. And it, again, Afro Afri Comics was the front. And they published a lot of these issues. They had a pretty big run, 47,000 wow. copies a month at 15 cents. Wow. For Mike. That is a hell of a lot. Yeah. Um, and he was, Mighty Man was an ex-cop. He kind of had, you know, generic Superman-like powers, right? Uh, didn't use weapons, all that kind of stuff. And he represented kind of the, the, uh, the cities in South Africa, if you will, right? And then they also published... Afri Comics also published another, quote, superhero comic called Tiger Ingvi. And I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right because it's Zulu, or Zulu rather. It's, uh, it translates to Tiger Leopard in Zulu. Um, and mm. He was master of man and beast, Tiger Ingvi was. And he was targeted more towards the rural population, right? So they had, you know, they sort of had this two-pronged propagandistic approach to control the black population. One was for the inner city with Mighty Man. One was for the rural with Tiger Ingvi. And like I said, Mighty Man was about 47,000 copies a month. Tiger Ingvi was about 43,000 copies a month. So they were running 90,000 copies a month of the book, which is crazy. Mm. And so I mentioned it was started by the Secretary of the Department of Information. His name is Rudy, right? So uh, Rudy somehow connected with a New Yorker named Richard Manville, who was like a marketing consultant. And he produced the strips out of New York. So I don't know whether, whether New York went to South Africa looking for a market or whether Rudy went to New York looking for comic book creators. I suspect it's the latter. But um, Manville produced these comics uh, in New York or created them in New York, right? So he had a bullpen of a dozen or more U.S. creators through Manville that worked in New York, including like Joe Orlando, who did some Superman work. A couple of D.C. guys that were like moonlighting and uh, a guy named John Albano, if you guys understand that name. Um, would be confused with Captain Lou Albano, totally different guy. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, so, so these comics were created in New York, probably without the full intent of, like, the New York crew didn't necessarily know the propagandistic nature of these, um, and then published, like I said, in South Africa. Uh, there was an incident where, um, kind of as revolts are happening, right, there was an incident where 
uh, some of the local population burned down newsstands specifically because of this book, right? And it was, it's an interesting thing because um, it, it basically backfires, right? So if your intent is to, you know, put out this mighty man, this exalted hero of, you know, obey the white police state, you know, the black residents saw exactly through that again, as propaganda and just burn down the newsstand. So it actually achieved the exact opposite hmm. of the propaganda, right? So instead of like subservience, it actually inspired political uprising. And as a result of that, there are very few of these copies in existence. Like wow. Almost no copy hmm. remain. Uh, there are a couple courses online. There's, uh, there's some that are digitized on ucla.edu, uh, which are, kind of interesting. They're in English. Um, I suspect they printed them in Zulu as well, but I didn't find any confirmation on that. But the copies that you can see pictures of and stuff are in English. Uh, hmm. And yeah, uh, following, following the uprising in 76, the guy who started this, Rudy, was charged with crimes. He fled to the U.S., eventually lived out his remaining years, eventually in exile. Um, the, and there's another interesting thing of this. They made a film Mighty Man film in 78, after all that stuff that I just said transpired, even after all that, they still made a movie in 1978, which I could find other Heidner era, but it's in Zulu, and I would love to see that, just to see, I'm sure it's horrible quality and cheesy as I am, but I would just love to see that just for historical purposes. Huh. Uh, but yeah, so so that Might, Mighty Man from South Africa, and I just want to throw out a couple, a couple URLs. There's South African comic books.blogspot.com, which I think you guys know who that is. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's George, isn't it? Yeah. So that's a good source. There's also internationalhero.co.uk, where I found some info on this and a great article written by Sydney uh, Cantano at uh, ucla.edu. Um, and Bill Mantlow actually wrote an article, a column about this in Comics Journal in like 70. Eight or something like this. I think that's where this first started to get a little bit of uh, global attention. But yeah, Mighty Man, I think is just a super interesting, you know, quick burn. It's like the dark side of mm -hmm. comics. Like if you've seen that show, Dark Side of the Ring. It's like this dark side of comics, this thing that's, you know, kind of an underbelly where they... You yeah, know, that's exactly the word I'd be thinking. Yeah, they're trying to exploit our beloved medium for these, you know, fucked up racial purposes. And it failed. It backfired. Right. So I, th I but I think it's an interesting story. Oh yeah. I'd love to get my hands on one of these incredibly rare books. Super yeah, cool. cool. Super cool. I love it when the, when the comics. Yeah. So that's my the political stuff in there as well. It's tells so, such a neat story, Eric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I love that. Uh, the thing I love most about it is the population mm -hmm. didn't fall for it. They just saw right through it. You know, like just the exact yeah. opposite intent. They saw the it. They result, saw it for what it's glorious. Um, mm. <laughs> they saw it as propaganda right. for something they didn't believe in. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, had you guys heard I'd of Mighty Man? Any any questions or comments? Scott, you, were you familiar? But I never fully realized hmm. um, how difficult they were to acquire. Have you? Have you? Have you tried? Uh, have you? Maybe ask George at Super Comics or ask any of our South African uh, members about it, how hard they are to find. Nah. Yeah, I haven't directly. If anybody knows, please comment. But yeah, the articles that I've read, the, the professor that I mentioned from UCLA basically went to South Africa and, you know, did a lot of due diligence to dig up copies. His name is William Parker. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there are other copies on surface since then, you know, the second book I mentioned, Tiger, I haven't seen any hmm. copies of that. So, you know, basically they were, I mean, if they printed that many, you would think that some remain, but if the tensions were so high and, you know, I imagine they, oh, yeah, they burned, got destroyed in protests ripped. and, you know, yeah, 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 yeah definitely thrown away, yeah. trash, everything, everything, ripped, everything yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm all super curious about what other American artists worked on this. You know, I, I would love to know that. And if, you know, did they, they know what they were working known, on? Because apartheid know? was, uh, you know, it, it was under the world's microscope. Well, they just might have. Right. True. 
But this is this is maybe years before. I mean, it's before uh, the U.S. Yeah. was fully aware of it, like in Sun City. That we didn't fully yeah. aware of it until the early '80s, right? So this was the mid '80s, and they could have they yeah. could have just had pages to do, right? They could have just had gotten a script, so they didn't necessarily know, and it may have not had yeah. the lettering. You know, the lettering could have been. It was just another else. job. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Look forward to the paycheck and move on to the yeah. 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 Because because Eric, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, very, I, very when, interesting. My understanding of apartheid was it wasn't official policy until like I mean the, there was the racism, but I, I I don't know if it was an actual state sanctioned until like the I mean late seventies, early eighties. I mean I I don't know where mm. that lies in that timeline. Yeah, actually, I don't know that either. It would I be interesting if this was like that, but, the South um, African government's yeah. kind of first four-way four way into that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. Yeah, it might, it might have been yeah. something they were using to try to lead into creating yeah, a mindset exactly. to get there. I mean, it'd be interesting. Interesting, yeah. Rather than it'd happening in the midst of it. would be interesting to see how, that, how it played into that. Yeah, there's... There's also a few articles of from the time, like Newsweek ran a piece about it in 76. Um, there's another one. I can't remember who published it, but in a couple of those articles, there is a, a direct inference that the CIA huh. was somehow involved. Wouldn't in be this. surprised. Our CIA was somehow involved in this. Right? No, me so, no. uh, Which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and yet not, not surprising, like you guys said. So... Yeah. So go look at the, go look at those links. There's, you know, the, I credit all my research to those links that I mentioned and I may, if I forgot one, I apologize, but you know, there's some pretty comprehensive articles on this. Definitely. Uh, so go check those out. Um, like yeah, that's said, very international hero.co.uk and uh, a couple on the UCLA.edu website. Yeah. Worth checking. Now I want, I so, want you to own one of those books, cool. Eric. We've got to find you. We've got to <laughs> Me find too. one of those books. How are we going to do that? I mean, I would, yeah. I would say, Eric, would to contact George. I mean, there, there is no one that knows the South African comic book market like George from Super Comics. Yeah. Contact George. Yeah. Ask him what yeah. he knows about it. See, see if, he, if he knows of any sources that might be able to, to find that. Um, you know, I would – this is kind of freaky, but – I would assume, just like you have races here in America that hoard Nazi memorabilia, I would assume that there would be racist yeah. elements in South Africa still that have those books. And, I mean, uh, that's kind of a, uh, yeah. a kind of a crazy yeah. thing, right? I mean, if... But if, yeah, yeah I wouldn't how would give you, him any money for it. I how would, would you uh, handle that? Let's get their address. If, if you were contacted by yeah. a South African... And said, "Oh yeah, I have a collection of these books. I've got, I've got them all." And I would, uh, I would call you three guys. <laughs> we would get some ski masks, and we'd break in overnight. <laughs> well, we would contact <laughs> Bantomas and have him go take care of the pool. Uh, <laughs> right? Mission. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, the thing about the CIA is super interesting too, because we all know that the CIA was involved in the uh, Kool-Aid man comic book production to get American kids yeah. hooked on uh, sugar. Right. Could be corn uh, syrup. Well, there's conspiracies <laughs> about corn syrup. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. They said, the let's CIA was behind that. We can make more money uh, using corn syrup and feed, <laughs> feed these people trash. Yes. It's bad for them. It's going to ultimately lead to their deaths <laughs> and let's make some money. Because <laughs> Iran Contra was sort of True like that, story. right? It was about selling guns to this person <laughs> yeah. to, to to get money to to, to fund was. CIA projects here and yeah. there and blah blah blah. It's like, I mean, even right now there are people that are saying True there. Uh, I read an article the other mm. day. There's an ex Green Beret that was trying to topple Maduro, and um, they are saying that the money for this little project was coming from wealthy business uh, people, but. How often is the CIA used wealthy businesses cover? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, rarely. I mean, so, yeah, yeah, it's all it's, up and up. It's that, it, uh, fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. 
Yeah. Wow. So let's. Uh, so that was my show with Hell, and I, you know, Ken you and Steve are, awesome. are awesome too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you? Which one do you want to? <laughs> which one do you want to? What's up? Oh, is it my turn? Matt. Matt, which one do you want to close? Oh, okay. Yeah, what's your show? So, what do you got for, for us? When, when, when you presented us with this, I thought, you know, just like you, Ken, I wanted something that I had some skin in the game for, you know, and, and um, you know, my father was yeah, born yeah, in Chihuahua, yeah. Mexico. And I have, a, I have a soft spot in my heart for the Mexican editions because I feel like when I source those books and I learn about those books, I'm... I'm learning and sourcing my way back to uh, a culture that uh, I'm, you know, kind of alien to, but where, you know, my roots come from Mexico. Um, and so uh, I immediately thought of Fantomas uh, for a lot of reasons, even musically. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Fantomas. Okay. So I'm, I'm mainly concentrating on the Mexican version of Fantomas, but Fantomas, if we're going to talk about him, we got to talk about where he, where he really started from. Um, and he really started from France. So Fantomas is a fictional character created by French writers, Marcel Allian, uh, 1885, 1969, and Pierre Sauvestre, 1874, 1914. So these guys were, you know, turn of the century guys and his origins was uh, Fantomas was an extremely popular villain in French crime fiction. He was created in France in 1911, and Fantomas had over 43 different volumes in French literature. But not only did he have, you know, the written word stuff, he had movies, he had comics, he had serializations. He, I mean, pick the media, pick the popular media format, and Fantomas was in it in France. Um, now, I don't want to go in too much depth because my main focus, of course, is his itineration in Mexico. But I will say that as far as the French literature, Fantomas was a badass over there, too. He was a criminal mastermind. He was ruthless. And check out some of this guy's nicknames, okay? The master of everything and everyone. The torturer. The elusive. This motherfucker did not fuck around. He tortured. He killed. He did whatever he needed to do to achieve his goals. Um, and so the French Fantomas, he wore a domino black mask, which I'm not exactly sure. I, I, I don't know what exactly is a domino black mask, but it reminds me sort of like you kind of like your uh, almost like, you know, Phantom of the opera isk kind of thing. Um, and he had a top hat along with his mask. Um, but in some French serials and in some instances, uh, they actually had Fantomas, Fantomas in a black leotard with a black, almost KKK-like hood. So, the, so his figure was, in France, Jeez. he was not a nice guy. Fantomas wasn't a guy that you looked up to. He was not a guy that you wanted to be around. He was a scary dude, okay? So that's the French Fantomas. Now, now you guys hmm. will have to excuse me. If my wife just got here with groceries, it's like the worst timing ever. But um, so I, I don't know how that's going to play out, but let's hope that it doesn't. <laughs> okay, so in Mexico, his first little entryway into Mexico was on March 1st, 1966. Fantomas made his Mexican debut, debut in Tesoro de Cuentos Clásicos, issue 109. So this is the late 60s. Now, the early versions of the Mexican Fantomas were basically just the French character villain just rewritten for Mexican audiences put, you know, so it was basically uh, the French Fantomas with a, 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 a splash of Mexican paint put over the top of him though. Okay. But over time he got transformed into this super cool anti-hero. So he was definitely an anti-hero. He, he, he wasn't like up uh, on the up and up kind of good, wholesome Superman type character. He was a Robin hood, James Bond type of guy. He was a millionaire. So he had tons of money. His secret base was on the outskirts of Paris. And not only was he a millionaire, but he was the rare type of millionaire that was noble and phil philanthropic. I can't say it. See, I can't talk to me. Philanthropic. Philanthropic. Yeah. So he, he um, you know, at this time down in Latin America, we have to remember that there was a huge class divide. You know, there was no middle class. It was a haves and have nots type of thing. So why the Mexican publishers decided to do this complete 180 on it, on the character, isn't necessarily known. But the thought is, is that, 
you know, the Mexican readers at the time, they needed to feel like there was justice in the world and that there was someone looking out for their, for their interest and their plight. And another interesting thing that I came along on this was according to what I, my research, no one approved this change. So when Navarro got the, the license, right, they did not, they just kind of took it and ran with it. There was no approval. So there was, there was no one ultimately in the, whoever had the French copyright that said, oh, yeah, you can do that. They just did it. And what I like about that is that Fantomas himself probably would approve of that. He would, Fantomas would be like, yeah, make me this guy, <laughs> right? I love it. I love that, though. But the consensus is really that he was changed to better appeal to the Latin American world's need for justice. You know, he, righting wrongs became his mission. He did it in style. I mean, the guy was amazingly stylistic. They think that a lot of that interpretation came from inspiration from the James Bond movies, right? So he had amazing James Bond-like mm-hmm. tech, and he had fine ladies all over the place, right? He had a healthy dose of machismo, and that's what you get. You get this quintessential Mexican Fantomas who is uh, looking out for the poor, easy with the ladies so the guy could get any chick that he need, wanted just like james bond had cool freaking uh uh toys and and different stuff to play around with had a secret layer which is awesome and you know anything of value jewels money uh you know stock options any anything that had value was fair game airplanes i mean anything from any way he could enrich himself but also enrich the lower classes was what he did. So he, this was the anti-hero that if you were in Latin America, you could root for this guy. He was enlightened. He was charismatic. He was kind. Um, and, and I love this, he was always surrounded at his secret lair by 12 voluptuous girls who attended him, each represented by a zodiac sign. Now, what, what, what was interesting <laughs> about this, right, um, was that it was kind of explained that these girls were almost sort of like the Charlie's Angels, right? These beautiful women that uh, that you found yourself in a jam that you could call, right? And they would show up, you know, maybe you know, with a sports car and help get you, bust you out of the thing. Very cool. Very sign of the times of the '60s and the '70s. Um, but uh, just really neat. Okay, so so you know, those cultural reasons for for the Frontomas poverty. Middle class wasn't wasn't really there, uh, and it was all also that was very you know prevalent at the time was corruption. There were huge amounts of corruption in Latin America in the sixties, seventies, and eighties. So, you know what what does corruption do to people? Corruption is like, you know, I, I feel like when it's in the political system, it's like a it's like it's like the virus. It's like the coronavirus, right? We're trying to fight that corruption. Fantomas. Mm is, I'm going to use it now because it's, it, it makes sense to me right now off the top of my head, but Fatomas is like uh, our inoculation against the coronavirus of the political corruption. He, he is the way, he's the guy that's supposed to keep it from happening, expose those politicians, all that stuff. Now, let's get back into his, into his look. That's the Mexican, cool. interesting. go ahead. Actually, no, okay. uh, one, sorry to interrupt you. We're trying to hit one. Oh, shit. We have like we're, five we're minutes running out. just to give you a time. time. Huh? I think we have 90 okay. minutes and we're coming Okay, up I'll be quick. Five. Mexico oh, Fossil oh, started out with a black top hat, but instead of a black mask like in France, he wore a white mask. We think that maybe that was to symbolize his change from an evil bad guy into a more kind of positive anti-hero. Um, they think oh, that his yeah. mask was inspired by yeah. Diabolic, an mm. Italian crime character, but they made it white mm. because they, again, uh, further inspiration, they think that he was, the white mask was inspired by the Mexican luchadore Santo. And Santo was, you know, this famous, <laughs> famous Mexican wrestler. He was awesome. You know, just like our WWE, he was, he fought the bad guys. He was awesome. Santo. Okay. Now, uh, what's interesting about Fantomas is that just like we were talking about political motivations, he was co-opted for politics. In the late 70s, there was this guy, uh, writer called Julio Cortacar. I don't know if I spelled, uh, pronounced that right. He was an Argentinian poet who wrote a Fantomas story in the newspaper Excelsior. 
Now, they released it in a comic book format, and the poet, this poet, made this story called Multinational Vampires. So at the time, remember that in Latin America, along with the CIA going in there and fucking all kinds of people up, we had these huge corporations going down there and just kind of raping uh, resources, right? So, yeah. so he made a, yeah. uh, a story related to that. I don't know exactly how it, it, it worked, but I'm guessing the Fantomas went in there and showed those multinational corporations who didn't give a shit about the people and were just raping them. They're what's what. Also, with mm -hmm. that, that story was not copyrighted from Navarro. So Navarro had the copyright. Julio Cortacar and the newspaper Excelsior just did it. Fuck copyright. Another thing Fatomas would probably approve of, right? Okay. Now, in the early 80s, <laughs> Mexico got a president who was horrible. Jose Lopez Portillo. His initials were JLP. And he was one of the worst presidents in uh, Mexican history, modern Mexican history, according to what I read. He was like a dictator. He was reviled. He was corrupt. He was a member of the ruling class. And he... He was a part of the political party. I don't know if people that know their Mexican politics, but the PRI, the PRI was a hated kind of just not people didn't, they were not populist. Let's just put it to you that way. Um, so he was a part of the PRI. So the editors at, at, at Navarro created a story where there was a country, a fictional country with a dictator who had the exact same initials as the president, right? And coincidence. Right. And coincidence. Of course, Total. Pure, of course, pure nice, coincidence. Nice. Fantomas went in there and <laughs> fucked them all up, yeah. right? But get this. The government of Mexico uh, bought all of the issues that they could find and even went in and confiscated these issues and destroyed them as being subversive. That's a dictator. <laughs> in a, in, so in, in the 80s, a freaking right. supposedly democratic huh. government in Mexico went in, took the comic books, and mm. destroyed them. That's crazy. That is crazy. So guess what are the most hard-to-find Fantomas stories now? It is these Mexican Navarros. They sell for thousands of dollars, I think. They're hard to find because most copies were destroyed as subversive uh, reading. So that is some real political shit right there. Um, you know, Fantomas was a foil against the government. He was the foil against these multinational corporations. He was a foil against the rich who in Latin America did not give a shit about, about the common guy. And so I just, I love the character. Um, he had a robot that was a really cool robot, did all kinds of really cool things well, but there was one problem with this robot. You know what the robot's problem was, guys? He could not pronounce his creator's name. Never could. Isn't that interesting? He could never pronounce his creator's name. He always mispronounced it in the stories. <laughs> okay. Um, another interesting That's thing. Um, Fantomas was presented at the 1994 Soccer World Cup in the U.S. So they made a comic book where he was going undercover as the beloved Mexican goalkeeper, Jorge Campos. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So they, they actually made a comic where he went to the U.S. and he, he went on some adventures while he was, you know, the, the Mexican goalkeeper. Um, so <laughs> awesome. So awesome. Uh, That's cool. Um, That's so cool. Fantomas was just, God, man. I mean, what can you say about the guy? He's a really cool guy. I, I have a line on his first appearance in Mexico. I'm hoping to get the book, guys. I'm wow. hoping to get that book. Um, I'm still figuring out the the, the details, but um, I'm I'm pretty close, I think, to possibly getting that. Um, so Fantomas was popular all throughout uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even a little bit into the 90s. But just like we see, go back and watch Octopussy and some of the old James Bond. There's definitely a misogynistic streak through the guy, just like there was in a lot of the old James Bond stories and movies. And so he lost some of his popularity, mainly because uh, some people think his just kind of his relations with women and some of those kind of old, you know, in our Me Too moment, mm -hmm. Me Too movement, Fantomas wouldn't quite work. You know, maybe um, maybe he could be retooled so he's Dang. not so misogynistic. Um, interestingly enough, there was actually an American Fantomas story. Um, and I, I, 
I was kind of blown away by that. Uh, it was a story by a guy, Paul Cooperberg and Roy Mann, and it appeared in Captain Action Comics mm-hmm. number one, <coughs> published in 2009 by Moonstone Books. So my plan is definitely mm-hmm. to to find that and read that story. Um, there were a couple. Vo- there was That's Navarro cool, changed the the numbering, so they did a volume two. Fantomas number one in the 70s. I think it was 72, maybe 73. I don't know exactly. Um, so they redid the numbering and then that went on for a while. And then, so he was a Navarro character for the longest time. But uh, Editorial Grupo Vid in the 80s, I know you guys, I, I've talked about them before. They they took on some Marvel and DC stuff in the 80s when Novidades li- lost the license. But his last incarnations were with Grupo Editorial Vid in the late 80s and I think maybe into a little bit of the early 90s. Um, but, but that's him. Fantomas mm. is, is uh, super cool, anti-hero. Um, you know, he, he was a millionaire. He was, he was like this James Bond. Like if you took James Bond and turned like James Bond coupled with the Punisher, coupled with some of these other guys and some of these other anti-heroes, and he just... A luchador, luchador. Yeah, a luchador, you know, because in, in Mexico at the time, the luchadores, man, <laughs> let me put it to you this way. Santo didn't have a problem oh, yeah. find, hooking up with chicks. He just didn't. He, you know, they, he, Santo, <laughs> you know, the saint, he was, you know, at the time, you know, the, 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 the perfect clear example of a machismo, powerful Mexican male. You know what I mean? And so he, he inhibited all of those traits. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's just super awesome. I, I, I'm really hoping I can land that book. I'd love a volume two from the, from the 70s. Um, and I just, I just kind of feel like with my research of this character, I'm just kind of getting back again, like I said, to, my, to some of my roots as a Mexican-American, um, a way for me to refine my culture, so to speak. And the political parts of it are awesome too. I, I love it. I love that he, that he writes yeah. wrongs and that he goes throughout Latin America and it's throughout Latin America. Remember that Navarro, you know, a lot of people say, well, there's Mexican editions, but remember that the Mexican editions were, were printed for all of Spanish speaking Latin America. So everyone uh, was touched by Fantomas in that way. And, and, you know, a little boy reading the comic could go, yeah, that guy's cool. He drives suit, you know, he has supercars and he's got hot chicks around him all the time. He's got, he's got millions of dollars. And if he ran into me on the side of the street, he'd probably go, Hey kid, here's 10 bucks. Go get you an ice cream or, or, you know, he's that guy. So that's Fantomas according to my research. That's, that's awesome. I, you know, it's funny you talking about that. I love you sharing it. I think we might have two hours, so forgive my time thing, but if we get cut off, that would be why. Ah. And things to find a minute. But, um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I love, uh, it's funny that you talk about, yeah. you know, he's kind of Robin Hood, right? But at the same at the same time, maybe it's just because I'm, I saw a mighty man ringing in my ears, but at the same time, he still yes. is part of the ruling class, like you said. So it's, there, there's this weird mixed message of like, you know, don't worry about it. I'll take care of the bad guys for you. But even though I'm part of the ruling class, I'm not one yeah. of the bad guys. We're not all bad guys. Trust me. I'll just yeah. take care of the bad guys for you, right? So it's it's all at once like inspiring, you know, uh, people to revolt in a way or recognize that they're yep. being fucked by the ruling class. But it also protects the ruling class because your your only hero is a guy from yeah. the ruling class, yeah. right? I'll say, right? There's this uh, <laughs> autocratic yeah, thing about it. Little... Yeah, it's interesting. Because, because you know, that's the thing. That's the thing about classism, right? Is that even the, if, if you're on the, if you're in the lower classes, the goal is to go up that class ladder, right? So it's still built. Right, it's still built into the yep. So yep. it's yeah, it's it's a real kind of head scratcher, but then at the same time, it makes perfect fucking sense. So yeah, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> Once I'm a millionaire, I'll be able to reap my revenge. The, uh, 1%. Yeah, just like yeah, Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne. I, I say that too. You know, like I was saying, he's he's an antihero. Yeah, just like Bruce Wayne yeah. is too. You know, he's he's got the money to create that stuff. Go ahead. Do you have? Do you have any of books of his? You said I, you're chasing down for his parents. Do you I have a collection I, of I've books? I've been wanting them, but just like we were talking about, like money stuff. Um, I had a chance to buy a volume yeah. one yeah. Fantomas from the early '70s, and it wasn't expensive. It was like sixty bucks. And then, and then I, I, I said, I really like this character. I, I mm. want to own some of his comic books, but I need this other thing for my set. You know, it's like, 
I, 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 I didn't get in, <laughs> but my buddy Cecilio uh, is helping me get some uh, uh, a book out of Mexico, and he's going to be sending me some Fantomas comics that he owned. So he remembers he remembers reading Fantomas. Cool. He has some Fantomas books, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna get some and. Uh, totally you know i love them and, and I'm, i might end up becoming a fantomas collector you guys and it's it's kind of one of these weird right things. On. go ahead he does he does he have yeah. powers like he his costume is essentially kind of a cape and a top hat mm-hmm. and the white mask he said and looks a little bit like mandrake yeah kind of looks like magician mandrake. or something no right? as far does as he i know powers? anywhere i read i did not see any powers his powers and that's why he kind of mm. seems more his powers are more like a super thief, right? So like a cat burglar. So he right. he's he's right. almost like that James Bond M- M- MI6 CIA agent type guy. He's got masks that he can wear uh to fool, you know, he's 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 my understanding of him is uh he's an expert at concealment and figuring out how to break into places. He can he can uh disable locks, he can you know, if, if the internet was around at the time, he'd be an amazing hacker. He's that guy, right? So very mm-hmm. much again, sort of like Batman. Doesn't have powers, just has, you know, like uh what's his name from Taken? I have a unique set of skills, remember? He's just he's got he's got <laughs> the fucking <laughs> skills to get her done. That's that's my understanding. No superpowers, no none of that. And most of his villains, one of the villains um, is Inspector Gerard. Now, Inspector Gerard, I believe, is a French policeman who's trying to protect the upper classes. And, you know, because Fantomas is a criminal. He's a millionaire, but he's still doing criminal yeah. acts. He's breaking into banks. He's, you know, exposing politicians that don't want to be exposed. He's, he's doing all that stuff. So, of course, uh, there's going to be an element of the law that is chasing him down. And um, so I don't, you know, I, I don't know enough about the stories to know how that interplay works. But I'm sure it's quite interesting, fascinating. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've talked to a few people and they said that, you know, think of uh, any of the kind of wealthy class that people hate. Right. Like, for instance, that uh, that pharma bro guy here in the U.S., you know, that guy that owned he owned like the, the only copy of that. <laughs> yeah. What was Martin's that guy's Shrelly. name, Eric? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Martin Martin's Shrelly. Shrelly. That piece of shit that's going to go and put, yeah. you know, make yeah. money off people's needs. That's the guy Fantomas is going to go after. That's the guy he's going to expose. And that's the guy he's going to, you know, in, either yeah. embarrass um, I don't – everything that I read, I didn't see that he did a lot of necessarily killing. Now, I could be wrong on that. Mm-hmm. He might be more like the Punisher in that way. But, you know, because I don't know enough about the stories to say that he killed or or not like the French one that killed and tortured whoever he wanted. I think maybe it would be more like he would take Martin Screlly, you know, figure out a way to get his money transferred to some other place and then, you know <laughs> – take off all his clothes and give him the hugest wedgie and have him hanging out with a sign outside the front of the scene saying, this is what I deserve or something like that. <laughs> That's kind of my understanding of how he would yeah. handle people. But I could be a little wrong on that. I don't know for sure. But he's fun. Fun character, guys. Yeah, if uh, if ever I heard a character described that needs to get into the hands of Quentin oh, Tarantino. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and <laughs> I would love to see some kind of resurgence. And And I think, you know, American Mm -hmm. pop culture and American media and all the talking heads all throughout, you know, they're always mining uh, properties from outside our nationalistic Mm -hmm. borders. Uh, The office is a, is a great, a great example. I mean, you name it, TV shows, whatever. I'd love if someone went around and said, Hey, look at this character Fantomas. He's pretty cool. Oh, and I think it's kind of like Mandrake. I think he also had like magician type abilities as well. Um, So, Mm -hmm. You know, look at this guy. Let's figure out a way to sex him up. You know, get Brad Pitt or some some, someone cool to to play him, and let's let's make either an an American comic book or an American. I I think he might make a good like HBO series. You know, and 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 oh, and one more thing, Mm. Eric, you're gonna love this. I figured out a way to tie it into music. Fantomas, one (laughs) of my favorite (laughs) lyricists of all time. Is Mike Patton okay? Mike Patton from Faith No More, Mr. Yeah. Bungle, I mean, you name it. Um, he, I think he's one of the most underrated uh, modern lyricists, vocalists of all time. 
Um, Fantomas is an American metal supergroup formed in 1998 in California. It features the vocalist Mike Patton from Faith No More and Mr. Bungle, drummer Dave Lombardo, from, an ex from Slayer, guitarist Buzz Osborne from the Melvins, and bassist Trevor Dunn from Mr. Bungle oh, and hey. Tom It's actual music. And it's like this crazy, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard Fantomas music, but it's like this crazy kind of avant-garde metal and Mike Patton uses his voice as an instrument, and it's cool. It's cool shit. So it even oh, extends cool. into music. And Mike Patton lived in, uh, I think it was San Diego, somewhere in lower California. So I think he was exposed to a lot of Latin America down there. And I don't know this for sure. I tried to find yeah. the, the, uh, the history of why he called this group Fantomas, and I can't find it. But I think that it might be related to the, either the Mexican Fantomas he, that he ran across down there and then maybe found the French character. Um, but I, I need to do more research on that. But yeah, Fantomas is also a avant-garde metal supergroup. Neat. Yeah, I bet you a lot of comics, Mexican comics, probably did make their oh, way yeah. into Southern California oh, yeah. comic shops. I've but, talked to uh, comic shop, yeah. uh, people that worked in comic shops in Miami, and they say all the time you saw spanish language comics make their way mm. into their shop and they just throw them in dollar bins so i'm sure that there was mm. tons of Such mexican comic output that made its way into uh california especially closer to the border san diego all that area and it had to have had an influence on some people and i wonder if it influenced mike Patton to call his supergroup Phantomas. i see mm. Nice. Well, thanks for, uh, yeah, I mean, that's an awesome foursome. There's, like I said, there's a website that has heroes from the rest of the world, and it's internationalhero.co.uk, and they kind of have it broken out by country and by hero. Um, it's not super comprehensive, but it's a good starting point because we just did four. I'm yeah, sure oh, I'm sure there's so know. many. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's hundreds and thousands, I'm sure. Yeah. Good stories, though. I like that we all, we all had different approaches and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, this was very fun. Cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Enjoy we have a great this. question, Maria. Thanks for <laughs> sending us off in that direction. Uh, before we do plugs, I wanted to just kind of throw out a question. I know we're kind of short on time, but, you know, um, I don't know a whole lot about Russian books. Um, mm -hmm. That's just a statement. Uh, what's, what's, can you, what's the deal? Can we do a segment on Russian books? If it's, is there enough there to do a segment on Russian books? Like the first publishers, well, how many, how often? Yeah. i tell you what we need to do, Eric, is we need to get, uh, yeah, he would, he would know. To talk about Russian okay. books. Okay. Because he and it would depends be on okay. what the question is. Are uh, you talking about uh, indigenous Russian material or the the marvel material that the whole thing you know i yeah i i i bit on a uh batman book from this early 70s it was it was like bet like it was in it wasn't in english it was mm -hmm. bet men mm -hmm. or something like that right uh it kind of fell through whatever that i wanted but the person couldn't locate it but then i got me thinking like what other books you know it didn't appear to be licensed you know so i'm just curious about uh you know, what publishers existed in Russia and for how long and, you know, through the government, Handle how it. did they, uh, did they have any, and did they have any issues, sure all that kind of stuff, of right? So I'm sure yeah. there was a lot of that. Yeah. 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 I'd love to do. I mean, what I have, se <coughs> what I have seen is, is a lot of like modern books. Uh, I see nothing right. like the um, Silver Age or anything right. like that. But but modern, you know, books translated into Russian. I but there had to be something. There That's was some bootleg Star Wars that, yeah, was, yeah. that uh, happened. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the neatest Star Wars bootlegs is a Russian bootleg. And um, mm -hmm. recently one sold for like $800. And it's extremely difficult to find. And I think that it was created still. I don't know the date exactly. When did the Iron Curtain fall? When did the USSR break up? Like 91, 90, 92. 91, I think 92. this one is from the eighties, so I think this would could be considered a communist bootleg Star Wars comic book. Um, but mm -hmm. there, and, yeah, yeah. and there was a yeah. few others, um, but I don't think there was a whole lot. That would definitely be a question for Doc Scott. He'd probably have more, more, more ways yeah. to yeah, get I, into that. I, I, 
I definitely suggest yeah. put a pin in that. That's a really interesting yeah. topic to follow. I'm going to throw out a few other topics. I uh, recently, my girlfriend went to Portugal, and he, he, before he went over there, I was like, ah. Oh, get any comics that you can find, especially that you had as a kid, he was cleaning out his, his mother had passed away. He was cleaning out the house and he said he had comics. As a kid. And I was like, yeah, find them, bring it back. I would love every, anything you can find. I will love it. Bring it back. Right. Um, find anything. But as I was talking through it, it seemed to be probably more classics mm-hmm. illustrated stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of occurred to me like, Good Lord, Classics Illustrated is the most ubiquitous thing. Uh, we should yes. talk about that at some point. Like, it seems like every country, since the beginning, of, since before printed paper existed, there were Classic Illustrators. It was there before, you know, time yeah. existed. I don't know. That just seems to be so ubiquitous. I want to I want to learn a little bit about that if you guys you know, Oh, yeah. And, I, and I'd love to research and find. Did, did you guys know there's a famous collector of Classic Illustrated who was collecting foreign editions of them? before the internet and apparently what he was doing (laughs) was he was making pen pals in countries any country he could imagine he would contact uh people there you know i think back in the days i never did it but i think there were like pen pal exchanges um that you could get so he would (laughs) contact them and he'd have to do it the old-fashioned way guys he'd have to mail people money checks and he was collecting these classic illustrators from all over the world i i for the life of me i've never been able to find out what the guy's name was where he was at even what country he was Mm. from all i know is that from what i've read he was a, a kind of a famous comic collector who he would that's what he was known for just finding classic illustrators from every country he could manage and he was doing it back in the 70s and 80s so i'd yeah, love too. to find his info. yeah i love mm. yeah yeah i'd love to do that would be awesome and to do it just to do an overview yeah. of classics illustrated because you know that's a that's a big can of worms. I'd love to learn more mm, about it. Yeah. Uh, mm, yeah, yeah. So any other topics before we get into our plugs and what you're um, hunting? Any other things you guys want to throw out? Nah. We got 12 not, minutes. Not for me. I minutes. actually have to go pretty soon. I got to eat some lunch, and then I got to go do a global comic safari. Up right My wife's going to kill me. Hey. Yay. <laughs> busy man. Busy man. No, I've just got... Uh, I've got things coming down the line, but you know it's all on hold until all this yeah. is over. So. Well, it's uh, anything from you, please. You want to make mention of no. before we uh, sign off? No, not much. Just you know, I, I'm also uh, I got a few uh, books in process that I'm working on. I'm still working on my Marvel 25ths, obviously, uh, and I do have a cool. few of those. But you know, I'm not again. I'm trying to be more frugal with my money and not spend a, a ton of it. So everything I'm getting is like mm. minuscule. Although I did have a good interaction with someone. Uh, about getting my hands on one of my Marvel 25th and having them, I sent them money. They're going to bid on it. They're going to get it. And then they're going to. Nice. So. And that happens to be, that happens to be a Brazilian. uh, Hulk 325. Nice. And it's not in Brazil. It's in, it's over in, you know, the Portugal, the other side over there. So uh, I'm looking forward to the bomb. Looking forward to getting that. Uh, Cool. So let's just do some plugs then. Well, thanks for, it was nice to chat with you guys as always. We should, uh, you know, um, we shouldn't take as, as get, long a break between get back this on one the and horse. the next episode. Yeah. 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 Right on. Uh, we will. We so will. yeah, yes. good to reconvene with you guys. Stay safe out there, please. Oh, yeah. Um, Ken, Ken com. Uh, that's where people can find you. Tell us about your website. That's the main website, yeah. Um, tons and tons and tons and tons of scans of, of what I've got. Um, but really, I, I use the website as a shop window. If you really want to get hold of me, then check out my YouTube channel. The aptly named Ken. Great video. Right on. And Matt, Define999, where can, people can uh, find, me can people on find you? At Define999. Also, you can find me on Global Comic Safari, a channel with uh, the. Uh, it's basically a channel within the staple of channels of the CBSI network. So um, CBSI has been a wonderful place that uh, has been very welcoming to foreigns and stuff. Um, I do that show with John Z and it's a fun show. Uh, so you can find me there on YouTube. Also find me on Facebook, um, find our group, um, find our FCC group. It's foreign comic collector magazine, official group. Also our podcast is 
Foreign Comics Calling. You can find us on Facebook as well. We have a wonderful community there. You can find Eric, Stephen, Ken, and me, and a whole bunch of other guys that are doing this. It's very welcoming. And, you know, come stop chasing grades. Stop being a slave to a number on a slab, comic collector. Come (laughs) see (laughs) and find this new world. There's a new world out there. I have a tagline now, too, Eric. Do you know what it is? This is my new tagline. No. I'm going to use it everywhere. <laughs> gonna... There right. are hundreds, if not thousands, of foreign comic collectors out there. They just don't know it yet. Hey. Yeah. 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 Love it. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, and even Stephen Bagley, Fleas, where can people find you? Good you sir? can find me on Instagram at Bago Fleas, B A G O F L E A S. Um, I'm also on Facebook after with my just my name, Stephen Bagley. Uh, and my business dealings, I do TGR Comics. TGR stands for The Grading Room. But, and just as Matt was, I'll counteract an hour over what Matt was just saying there, you know, don't be a slave to a grade. But, hey, nothing wrong with getting those foreign grades no, either, no. Regard, regardless of what that number <laughs> yeah. is. So, I, don't, I don't mean true. to say so, that yeah, I'm anti-slab. True. I own slabs. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm being, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm being extreme. <laughs> How's do I? But yeah, I uh, you can yeah. you can find that at TGR Comics on uh, Instagram or TGR Comics on Facebook. I do uh, I go around once shows get back up and running again, and we can start uh, kind of getting back to normal and have our conventions again. Uh, I can get people's books signed, uh, submitted for grading with CBCS uh, or what have you. So feel free to look into there or just check out what I've got for what I've been doing. And uh, if you need anything done, I can obviously help you with that. Once things get somewhat back to normal, right on. Cool. Yeah, and like I said, stay safe out there, my oh, friend. Yeah. Um, and you can find us foreign comics calling on iTunes, on Breaker. Like I said, on Anchor. Thanks for hosting this. Uh, any of those places, please leave us a rating, a review. We don't uh, we don't have advertising, so your ratings and reviews uh, feeds our souls <laughs> going. So, uh, as always, a pleasure chatting with you guys. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Wonderful, guys. We will, we'll see oh, you, yeah, we'll we'll see see you on, on the other side. Stay oh, yeah. Absolutely. Just before we all go, normally I just say a little thing, but because of the current period we're in, I don't really feel like saying that. But what I will say is, yes, smelling those old <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Bye, bye, my friends. You guys be safe. Uh, Have a good one. Cool.